Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew Donellan. I'm an open power firmware and kernel engineer working for the IBM Linux Technology Center in Canberra, Australia. Uh, I have a very exciting disclaimer slide to show you as uh, IBM takes no responsibility for the next 20 minutes of lies and falsehoods uh, that I'll be sharing with you today. Um, so, uh, OpenCAPI. Uh, I expect a lot of people in this room will have already heard about OpenCAPI. There was an entire um, FPGA stream yesterday with a lot of open cappy talks so i will uh kind of skip over the marketing spiel um but the open coherent accelerator processor interface it's high bandwidth 25 gigabit gigabytes per second uh, it's ultra low latency it's designed specifically with uh, fpga implementations in mind um, and very importantly most uh, distinctively it is coherent uh, it's an evolution of the PCIe-based CAPI protocol that was launched with Power8, um, except with a, a new physical link layer that's uh, higher performance and lower latency. Uh, but open CAPI devices can operate natively within an application's virtual address space. Uh, they have auto it has automatic address translation, uh, maintains coherence with the host processor, and this essentially means that you can you know, treat your OpenCAPI accelerator as if it's just another thread of a multi-threaded application. Um, so this has a massive impact on the way that you do uh, software development uh, for OpenCAPI applications. Um, it makes the programming model for OpenCAPI accelerators uh, much lower overhead and simpler. You can just pass your standard C pointers um, between your application and your device and things just magically work. Um, so in this talk, I will be um, showing you the uh, OpenCAPI software stack. Um, going through how we actually get from plugging in an OpenCAPI card to uh, running applications that make use of OpenCAPI's memory uh, coherence. Um, I should note that for those of you who weren't at the um, FPGA stream yesterday, there's a couple of really good talks uh, that were given um, particularly by uh, Bruno and um, Brian yesterday on the um, OpenCAPI protocol and also the SNAP framework, um, which is also something that's definitely worth uh, looking into um, if you're interested in CAPI programming. So um, if you didn't go to those talks yesterday, I would definitely recommend you go get the recordings afterwards. Um, so we're going to work ourselves up from the basics. Uh, we've bought our very shiny new Power9 box uh, and bought a uh, wonderful open CAPI FPGA from one of our partners, like Alpha Data, um, and plugged it in and powered it on. Um, so what actually happens when you boot a machine with an OpenCAPI card installed? Um, so the first part of our OpenCAPI software adventure is SkiBoot. Um, SkiBoot is part of the OpenCAPI, uh, the OpenPower uh, firmware stack. Uh, it implements the OpenPower abstraction layer, or OPAL. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, uh, definitely go watch the recording of uh, Stuart Smith's talk, which is going on in the next room, uh, where he explains a lot of that. Um, SkiBoot is responsible for a lot of hardware initialization before we get to the point of loading the Linux kernel. Um, and it also provides a bunch of runtime APIs to Linux that uh, Linux uses for various um, machine dependent, uh, you know, very bare metal um, hardware management. Um, so when it comes to OpenCAPI, uh, SkiBoot does a bunch of things. Uh, that are needed to initialize OpenCAPI devices and provide runtime support for Linux. Um, as you can see here, you know, I've got a machine, I've booted it, it's running an extremely legitimate released version of Opal that was definitely not a random Git branch I had lying around uh, when I made the slide. <laughs> um, it's detecting that there's an NPU, an NVLink processing unit. Um, that's the part of the Power9 chip that is responsible for NVLink and OpenCAPI devices. Um, NVLink and OpenCAPI are serviced by the, um, by the same hardware on Power9. They use the same physical link layer. Um, so it's detected an NPU, it's initialized that, it's uh, detecting the presence of an OpenCAPI device in a, in a slot and configuring that appropriately. And it's uh, kicked off the hardware link training process, which trains our 25G link. Um, so we've detected our OpenCAPI card, we've trained the link, and as you can see down here, um, we've now registered a PHB. Um, a PHB is a PCI host bridge, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar. Um, and through this PHB, we've actually probed two PCI devices. As you can see, they show up um, 
just like a PCI device would. Uh, they've got an IBM vendor ID and there's two um, PCI functions on this device. So why am I talking about PCI? Um, this is the first thing you'll notice about how OpenCAPI devices appear to software. Uh, OpenCAPI devices look like PCI devices. They're presented just like PCI devices. They're connected to a PCI host bridge. Um, they've got you know, a vendor ID and a device ID and all the other things that you typically see when you probe for a PCI device. Um, and the reason that we chose to implement uh, OpenCAPI like this uh, is, like many other protocols that have uh, disguised themselves as if they're PCI, uh, it means that we can leverage all the existing infrastructure, all the support for PCI devices that exists within um, the operating system, within the Linux kernel, uh, without needing to implement our own bus completely from scratch. Um, and so, you know, if we boot into Linux and we run LSPCI, uh, as you do with regular PCI devices, and as you can see, we've got devices that look just like PCI. Um, we've got two functions. They advertise themselves as processing accelerators, a PCI class 12 uh, device. Um, there's a driver bound to it, OCXL, which we'll uh, get to in a minute. Um, we've got two functions and each of them has a PCI configuration space for retrieving device metadata, which is where all this information is coming from. Um, you can see that we've got uh, memory base address registers for memory mapped I.O., um, just like you would with a regular PCI device. Um, and it's got PCI capabilities and all the other things that come with being PCI. Um, so a Linux driver can just bind to this device. Uh, it can retrieve device information and do configuration in the way that you expect using standard PCI access methods um, provided by the Linux kernel. Um, so there is some OpenCAPI specific configuration stuff as well. Um, some of that is done through um, uh, extended capabilities, which you can't see here. Uh, through PCI config space, and there's also some stuff that needs to go through the Opal API to ski boot, um, but I won't go into that here. Uh, so, so far, um, everything looks good. It all looks like PCI. We've got a device. It can pre present up to eight functions, uh, just like a PCI device can present up to eight functions. Um, but this is where things get a little more complicated. Uh, so each function can have multiple attached functional units, or AFUs, uh, which you may have heard about if you've been to the other um, OpenCAPI talks so far at this conference. Uh, and on each AFU, we can open multiple contexts. Uh, so what's an AFU? Um, so an attached functional unit uh, is an individual block of accelerator functionality. It can be something like a compression engine or a data acquisition engine or you know, whatever it is that you're accelerating. Um, you can have multiple AFUs uh, on a card or on a particular function, um, each being a completely different type of accelerator. Obviously, that's um, you know, the number of AFUs that you can have is uh, fundamentally constrained by how much uh, silicon you have on your FPGA or your ASIC. Um, but uh, as far as the protocol is concerned, as far as the um, configuration uh, specification is concerned, you can advertise as many different, um, you know, up to some limit, like 64 or whatever it is, um, but you can advertise multiple different uh, types of uh, functionality um, which do completely different things and completely different accelerator engines in your FPGA hardware. Um, and I also mentioned contexts. Uh, contexts and passives, process address space IDs. Um, so that's how we associate an AFU with the virtual address space of a particular application. Um, so whenever an application wants to make use of an AFU, it needs to acquire a context. Um, the maximum number of contexts that you have, that's um, dependent on the hardware design and obviously the resources that you have in your hardware to keep track of the state of multiple different applications. Um, so the AFU can declare how many contexts it supports. Um, and when, you, when an application opens a context, the uh, operating system allocates a PASID uh, to represent it. And through various layers of um, indirection, that's actually used to generate a handle, um, which is used, you know, which is actually included in the open copy, the packets on the open copy bus to associate a particular you know, read or write or memory access um, with a particular 
uh, process ID and thread ID, um, which can be used to uh, manage the virtual memory. Um, so yeah, if you want your entire AFU to be dedicated to one application, you can restrict it to just having a maximum of one context. Um, but otherwise, this is how we share an AFU between multiple applications concurrently. Um, we open multiple contexts, and with each transaction over the bus, um, that each transaction is associated with the specific application um, that registered that context. Um, so just like with PCI, we have memory mapped I.O. Um, we use MMIO to communicate with our accelerator and you know, tell it what to do. Um, so you don't use MMIO to do the you know, large scale data transfer that um, you know, you're meant to be doing through the fact that you've got coherent, um, coherent access to host memory. Um, but you do need MMIO to be able to initialize and set up the device and tell it um, you know, what it is that it needs to, needs to do. Um, so an open copy device advertises two different types of MMIO regions. Um, the first is an AFU global MMIO space, which is per uh, um, for each one for each AFU on, on your device. Um, so that's used for AFU wide global configuration. Um, and you also have a per passive uh, MMIO space, which is configuration for each individual context that you open. Um, so I just mentioned this here because this will come up a bit later. Uh, so we booted our system. We're in Linux. Uh, we have a PCI device. Now what? Uh, enter the OCXL driver, which can be found in your uh, Linux kernel tree at driver slash misc slash OCXL. Um, it's named OCXL because it's the open successor to the previous driver for CAPI, um, which is called CXL for reasons I won't go into. Um, there are two different ways of using OCXL. Um, so firstly, you can use it as a standard driver for the most common category of open CAPI use case. So that's where you have an accelerator which you want to pass through to your user space application so that a user space application can use it directly. Um, so in this case, the, you have the OCXL driver bind directly to your PCI device um, and it will expose a user space API, which we'll discuss a little bit more in a minute. Um, but secondly, there are some other use cases, uh, particularly stuff like um, storage uh, devices or network cards where you may actually want to implement a driver within the kernel. Um, and so for this case, OCXL provides an in-kernel API um, that you can use to write a standard Linux driver, um, but without having to deal with any of the you know, open CAPI device setup and configuration, it provides an API that allows you to do stuff like setting up contexts and destroying contexts and um, all the other stuff that we would typically expose to user space. Uh, so I'm not going to go into that case um, in this talk, but you know, just be aware that that's, uh, that's an option. And as various open CAPI accelerators come out, we expect to see there will be kernel drivers um, also using OCXL um, for those types of devices. Um, so how do our open CAPI AFUs get exposed to user space? Uh, this is Unix. Everything is a file. We have a directory. It's called slash dev slash OCXL. Um, and we create a file. We have a character device, one for every AFU that we detect on a card. Um, so as you can see here, we have a character device. Um, it's called IBM memcopy3, and then the um, PCI device, um, bus device and function number uh, associated with it. Um, so the each AFU has a name. That's retrieved via config space and then placed into the file name there. Uh, and applications interact with the AFU basically how you would expect in a um, Unix style, everything's a file approach. Um, to allocate a context, you call open. Um, and to attach the context, to actually enable that context, you use an ioctl. Uh, to retrieve device metadata, you use an ioctl. To manage interrupts, you use an ioctl. And when you're done with it all, you close the file and it releases the context. Um, so OCXL also handles uh, events that are coming from the device that includes interrupts as well as translation fault errors. Um, and so that's done, uh, that's also managed through this, um, through a file descriptor interface using the event FD subsystem for um, uh, event queue management. And so that's also done through accessing this file. Um, so to make all this easier, uh, we have lib OCXL. 
Uh, libocxl is a very thin library that provides wrappers for all the AFU man management functionality that um, is exposed by the OCXL driver. Uh, again, this is a, the open CAPI successor to libcxl, which you may have used if you've used um, CAPI 1 or CAPI 2. Uh, and again, it follows the same approach of being a very thin wrapper um, around that management functionality. Uh, it's packaged in uh, every cool distribution near you. Um, just apt install it. It's written in plain old C99. It has a grand total of one dependency, which is libc. Uh, it's designed to be really easy to integrate in a wide variety of applications. So it's not a comprehensive framework or anything like that. Um, this is a lot lower level than the Snap framework, uh, which you may have heard about. Um, it's, it's really just a bare, um, you know, the, the minimum you need to make it easy to access and manage uh, an open copy device. Um, it's also available under the uh, Apache license, so it you know, should be good to include in um, pretty much any application you want. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to discuss the libocxl API, but uh, before I go on, it's um, probably just a good chance to mention the OpenCAPI simulation engine, uh, OCSE. Um, OCSE is a framework that allows developers to test their uh, AFU um, you know, Verilog or VHDL along with the, their user space code. Uh, so it's available through the OpenCAPI consortium um, and it essentially simulates everything that you can see in this red rectangle uh, here. So you have your AFU logic, your HDL, which you simulate using a simulator like NCSIM or similar. Um, that exposes a socket to the simulation engine uh, and on the other side it presents an um, alternative implementation of libocxl, which your application can use. So I won't go into more detail, but the point is you can simulate your AFU and you can test it using exactly the same code as you would on a real device. Um, so back to libocxl, uh, let's go through an example. Uh, you may have noticed the AFU I've got installed is called memcopy. Uh, memcopy is a sample AFU design uh, made available through the OpenCAPI consortium to members. You can probably guess what it does. You pass it the address of um, the effective addresses of two buffers in memory and it copies from one to the other. It's very exciting. Um, libocxl ships with a sample application that uh, shows off all the key API functionality. Um, so we'll take a quick look through the sample source code. Um, the full example is quite long and comprehensive. It shows off a lot more of the function um, the functionality of the library. So what I'll show you here is a cut down sample. It skips over the more advanced stuff or you know useless things like error handling. Um, I highly recommend you read the full thing. You can find it in the libocxl git repository and the samples directory. Uh, so here's main. Um, we first call um, you know, ocxl afu open. That searches dev ocxl for an afu that matches the right name and it opens it, which sets up, it allocates a context. Uh, we allocate a couple of buffers, source and destination. We fill source, we clear destination. Uh, and then we do the mem copy, we check the result, and we close the AFU. Um, so how do we actually do the mem copy? Well, first we need to figure out how it is that we actually tell the AFU what it needs to do. Um, so obviously this is completely dependent on your particular application, your accelerator, and your hardware design. Um, but the approach to the mem copy AFU takes is defining a queue of work elements. Uh, each work element represents a command or a particular job. Um, and the work element here, you know, as you can see, it's a struct uh, that's packed uh, and laid out according to the hardware specification for this particular AFU. It's got the kinds of fields you would expect. It specifies a command, it specifies a status, it's got a pointer to the source and the destination and the length. Um, and we wrap that in a, you know, a pretty standard list. Um, so the way you manage workloads on your accelerator is going to be completely dependent on exactly what it is that you are doing and the approach you choose to take. Uh, you don't have to do this, but this particular model of defining a queue of jobs, you know, it's kind of generally fairly common and uh, an approach which will work for a lot of uh, different types of accelerator workloads. Um, so this is the function where all the action happens. So first we initialize a, uh, an empty work queue. Um, we prepare a work element descriptor. That's basically just a pointer to the work queue so that the AFU knows where it is. Um, we do a little bit of bit twiddling there to tell it where the, um, to embed the size of the work queue into that pointer as well. Um, we set up a work element with a 
com copy command and a size and a source and destination pointer. Uh, and note that we don't do anything special here to allocate any of this in a special memory region or anything like that. The only things that we do are when we allocate a work queue, we make sure it's on a page aligned boundary. Um, I'm not exactly sure why we do that, but um, that's a requirement of this particular AFU design. Um, and we just make sure that the pointers are in the correct endianness. Um, but we don't do anything special to put it in a, you know, there's no MMIO or anything involved at this point. By the magic of address translation, everything just magically works. Um, so we call uh, OCXL AFU attach. So that actually attaches the context, which puts it, um, you know, that means that we write the, um, the process element into the um, shared process area, which causes the uh, hardware to actually start doing address translation. Um, we map the per passed MMIO space that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so OCXL gives us a handle and it gives us a, um, some accessor functions to wrap that. Uh, we allocate an interrupt for handling errors. Um, so the library and the driver uh, provide a mechanism for, for allocating that. Um, so on power, we actually allocate a trigger page for each interrupt. And the interrupt handle is actually the effective address of that trigger page. Uh, and when the OpenCAPI device sends an interrupt request with that particular effective address in it, um, the hardware magically turns that into an interrupt that hits that trigger page and rises up through the kernel. Um, and so the OCXL driver exposes those interrupt events, as I mentioned, through um, eventFD, through a file descriptor. And libocxl provides wrappers um, to access that event queue and, see and process events as they're coming in, like a, a select style, um, epol style API. Um, I won't go into that here, but um, you can see that in the source code if you look at it. Um, so we give the work element descriptor uh, to the AFU by, again, by using an MMIO write to the particular offset where we write the WED. And at this point now that the WED has been set, the AFU is continually polling um, that, uh, that queue for incoming commands. Um, that's the way this particular AFU is designed. Uh, so we then add the, um, the uh, copy work element that we were defining earlier into the work queue as our first uh, work element. We then add a stop work element as well, um, which tells the AFU that this is the end of the queue and it can stop um, trying to process anything. Um, so we've added all that. We've now got a complete work queue. We've now got a work element descriptor, which has now been, um, the queue has now been polled. Uh, Again, the, the WED is just an effective address um, and the AFU is reading that through its effective address and address translation is happening to return that data from main system memory. Um, so in order to kick everything off, we first do a memory barrier to make sure everything's written. And then we just set a valid bit on the um, first mem copy uh, work element to tell the AFU that, it, um, that every, all the details have now been written out and it can now start to process it. And just remember that this is just flipping a bit in main system RAM. It's not MMIO or anything like that. Um, it's just a regular old uh, store instruction. Uh, and the AFU will see that the, uh, the next time it polls the queue and sees that there's now a valid command for it to execute. So at this point, the AFU has picked that up. It will commence the copy. And now all we need to do is wait for it to complete. Obviously, it's asynchronous. So you know, in a real world application, you may not want to wait for it to complete, but in this case, this example is a benchmark, so um, we want to wait for it to complete and then do our um, timing. Um, so I won't go into exactly uh, into what this function does here, but um, you know, the simplest way, obviously, is to just have a loop that cons uh, continually polls the status field of the work element until it sees a complete bit, uh, which, you know, that's um, the naive approach. It's not particularly efficient, um, but the AFU also supports um, setting up an interrupt and waiting for an interrupt event. And it also supports the um, wake host thread feature, which is where a hardware thread can go directly to sleep um, using the uh, Power ISA 3.0 wait instruction. And then the device can send a wake host thread command that immediately causes that thread to, um, to wake up. And it can then check the queue to find out that it's complete. Um, so I won't go into that here, but again, it's available in the source code. You can see how, it's, how we do it. It's not particularly interesting. It's very, very simple. Um, so if you take all that code and then add in all the logging and error handling and all the other stuff I've skipped over, it ends up being about 600 lines of code altogether. 
Um, this is the sample program actually running. Um, we set up a two kilobyte source buffer and destination buffer. We set up a work element queue, memory gets copied, and it gets copied correctly. Um, so obviously this is a very simple example, uh, but I hope this shows you that th these are all the main things that you need to start building an open CAPI application using libocxl. Um, one of the main advantages of the open CAPI programming model is that with coherence and with address translation, it's really low overhead, it's really easy to get started, and it's really easy to just integrate this into, um, you know, into existing applications without, uh, you know, needing to intrude too much on the, um, the way that you currently write your code. Um, and so with the OCXL kernel driver and the libocxl library doing all the heavy lifting of, um, of AFU management and device management for you, um, it's really quite easy to get started. Uh, so there's more stuff which I haven't got the time to go into here. Uh, so firstly, I would recommend that you check out the uh, rest of the libocxl API documentation. So that's available at opencapi.github.io. Uh, and of course, there's also more information about OpenCAPI more generally available on the OpenCAPI consortium website at opencapi.org. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs>